according to a data in a population of 1.3 billion, every 25.3 women per 1 lakh is diagnosed with cervical cancer in India. Approximately 1 lakh 25,000 women get diagnosed with cervical cancer every year and 70,000 to 80,000 succumb to this death. And, uh, and with this, we will begin by understanding from Dr. Vijaya, why is there such a high incidence of cervical cancer in India as compared to the Western world? It's true. Uh, so many people are unaware there is a screening that exists. The first point is uh, it is not uh, seen visibly. Uh, like breast cancer where the people can notice immediately if there is a change in the uh, size of the breast or there is any bleeding or discharge whereas the service is a hidden part uh, inside our genitalia and people are very very apprehensive to go for an uh, annual checkup uh, because they are not uh, that much illiterate and also the uh, lack of awareness of uh, screening that is the utmost important point uh, but the only positive in uh, uh, cervical cancer is it presents with bleeding and white discharge but then by the time it is delayed the cancer has already come into us what our aim today is to detect this in the pre-invasive stage uh, so more of uh, uh, health education and especially starting with the school is more important to create awareness so when we talk about the lack of awareness and on on uh, being the contributory factors what are the other factors do you think are uh, causing this uh, rise in the uh, cervical cancer? Uh, like, uh, you know, this uh, 25 person, uh, 25 per 1 lakh is the incidence of cervical cancer and it's more common in the developing countries. And in our state, Tamil Nadu, uh, part of India, where we are the foremost runner of the healthcare programs and we are the number one, we can, I can boldly say Narendra Sair is there, but still I can boldly say Tamil Nadu is one of the, uh, the best in the healthcare program implementation. Uh, so we have started training our staff nurses in detecting the pre-invasive cervical lesion at the earliest. Uh, so we have just now started and we have included the cancer also in the non-communicable disease program and so the, we are targeting on the staff nurses uh, that is where we can reach the innermost part of the village thank you thank you dr vijaya now we understand that cervical cancer can be cured if diagnosed at early stage to know how regular screening makes such a huge difference i would like to come to you dr narendra how according to you do gynecologists play a crucial role in prevention of cervical cancer So, uh, adding to Dr. Vijayas, I did my residency uh, in Pondicherry under Dr. Rajaram. We had an Ethicon Fellowship and uh, that place was like the, the cancer cervix uh, uh, hub and we saw so many operations on that coastal and so many cases that we were shocked that India has so much cancer in the coastal India, probably because of sailors coming in and promiscuity and all that. And we had a fantastic um, build up and that changed my whole thing that I want to do cancer only. Uh, unfortunately, could not go into cancers in detail and uh, shift it to infertility. But uh, that was my first exposure after my MD into cancer cervix. And then uh, we, we took part in a lot of FOXI programs. I was a FOXI chair, chairperson in the 90s. And then 2008, I became the president of FOXI. So now FOXI is Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecological Societies of India. It has got 38,000 members and uh, it has spread over 232 cities as branches. Now we have 27 committees. We have an oncology committee and we have a public awareness committee and we have a women's health committee and we have an imaging science and diagnostic. So all these committees every year celebrate all the cancer days and we do programs on awareness with Foxy every, every month. So there is a program on cancer cervix. Still eight women are dying per minute of cancer. So it's as big as maternal mortality of cancer cervix and breast. So we still need a lot of awareness. And then we have one of our uh, Foxians, Dr. Nirja Bartla of Delhi, Ames, who's the member of the International FIGO Cancer cervix uh, committee so we got we we take part we took part in the uh, finding of guidelines we took part in the cancer uh, cervix evaluation and treatment guidelines 
uh, as uh, Foxy. So Foxy has been very, very active in cancer awareness programs all over India, and it still is. And this month, again, we saw, because uh, January is the month of cancer cervix awareness, so we saw a lot of programs on the 30th. Again, Foxy is doing a very huge awareness program all over India. There have been uh, cancer cervical camps, which have been organized all over India uh, by visual um, uh, in, uh, examination, by acetic acid tests, by pap smears. So, so a lot of work has been done, but I think we still need to do more to make the public aware that this is a problem which can be cured if you come early. So that that is what is the biggest challenge. Thank you so much, Dr. Narendra, for sharing what Foxy and the initiatives that you've also taken part in. Could you tell us some of the challenges uh, that you face and how do you think that the new technologies are helping in solving those challenges? So the biggest challenge is uh, standardization. Biggest challenge is that the doctor or the uh, small, small clinic in the villages or in the periphery, what do they do? So they put in a speculum and they write cervical erosion and that's it. And probably they will take a conventional pap uh, smear if it is available, probably not even that. And they will not do the acetic acid test and they'll not do the local iodine test for visual. So VIA algorithms were made by us and circulated right down, but still uh, to a lot of uh, teaching has to be done to the periphery doctor first. So if the doctor at the periphery, the primary health center or a Foxy member or a gynecologist from the city goes to the primary health center and does the visual examination uh, by a standard protocol and an algorithm and has a colposcope and has an intelligent colposcope which could be carried everywhere and uh, simple logals and, uh, and then probably make a very standard diagnosis. Whether it's coming in dysplasia, whether it's just a squamocolumnar junction abnormality, whether it's punctate lesions, whether it's hyperemia, whether it's um, whatever. And so then we can, once we get a standard diagnosis from everyone, then only we'll be able to do um, uh, standard treatment and give them standard line of treatment. So uh, catch this cancer or what we call is spot the cancer before it spots you. And uh, that is uh, what, what we gave as a slogan. But, and here we have uh, now a visual check machine, the EVA, which uh, we've been using since the last one and a half years in our uh, private clinic. Uh, we've hardly kept any charge for it, but with, with this and contributed to the, the, from the five Indian centers, we, our center has been the one who's contributed to the artificial intelligence software, which has been made from 500 doctors all over the world. So this, this uh, once you get that picture, automatically it gives you these are the options of the diagnosis, which could be. You can modify the diagnosis if you think the machine is telling you wrong, but then it, it goes into a lot of help in standardizing the diagnosis part, which is very, very important. Coming to you, Dr. Malika, how can uh, technologies like Dr. Narendra uh, mentioned, Eva, transform screening situation in India, according to you? Firstly, I want to thank you for having me for this webinar. It's a real privilege. Now, surely the EVA has um, radical, radically changed screening uh, for cervical cancer. Now, in the sense that, um, uh, I, you know, I have been working with EVA now for the past two to three years, and uh, in, I belong to Apollo Hospital and to the Apollo Hospital Research uh, Wing. So we have done a pilot study which involved um, six centers all over uh, the south of India. And, um, and we did a pilot study for the eff efficacy of EVA. And um, uh, we found that, you know, that the, the, the thing about it, firstly, the device itself, um, it consists of these three parts, as you know. The first part being the, the device itself, where it contains the 
beautiful light, um, the kind of light that you have, non-polarizing, uh, glare-free light, which is uh, which is actually loaded into this ever, is something which is very, very useful. I mean, if you have been using a regular corpuscope, you know what I'm talking about because um, it is not cumbersome and it is so easily um, inbuilt into the system. Now, in addition to this, you have um, uh, you have a 16 time magnification, which is also very good because if you were looking at something like a villi, you're looking at it with uh, just your own bare eyes, your vision is limited. But when you can, uh, when there's an enhanced image um, and uh, Eva is enhanced visual analytics, so when there's an enhanced image, you definitely see much better. So like uh, Dr. Narendra was saying, you know, you can make out the the squamous columnar junction, you can make out any abnormalities over there, you can make out punctate lesions, you can you can put the green filter and you can check check out for vascular changes. So all of these things that is the 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 actual um, uh, what you call the technology behind it really helps you it enhances what you are doing you know it enhances what you're seeing and therefore what you're diagnosing it is much easier and therefore also more accurate and then of course um, that's not the end you also have the software the software helps uh, an easy flow of work if you know what i mean um, you're able to you're able to um, you know sort of tabulate each patient into the into your device and then you're able to put in into the same uh, framework you're able to say what her symptoms are her last period her um, number of children you know all the basic information that you need and it all goes into one package and you do not have to turn pages and um, and then and then you take the images you're able to save the images under the same heading and also the other thing is the portal the portal is that you are able to actually when you have taken these images you're able to sync your work and given your clinical impression you're able to sync your work onto the portal onto the cloud wherein um, i'm sure dr narendra is doing this also wherein i am now looking at images which are taken all over india you know Suppose somebody buys a device uh, initially um, and they are not very familiar with, um, with you know, the various, um, you know, diagnose that you can make. Um, and uh, in that, in that uh, situation, they would send the images to me through their portal and they would share their ID with me actually. And then I would go online, find that image and give a diagnosis. So then they share the diagnosis with the patient. So, so it's like half a headache, you know, you don't have the full headache, you just have to take the images and send it. So I think this is a fantastic tool uh, and um, it, it, is, uh, it is well worth, you know, using and, um, it, and, and especially like, like Dr. Narendra pointed out, if we would use this in centers where, um, you know, doctors have not had the chance to actually, um, you know, uh, upgrade themselves and, uh, or sort of spend many hours, you know, going through some kind of a, a training, that if they could just take these images, if they could take good images and send it across, you know, um, somebody could actually interpret it for them and their patient really benefits. So in one shot, everything is over. Then you don't have to first do a pap smear and then you don't have to then come back. And then, you know, uh, after that, when the report comes and then come for a corposcopy and then come back. So all that sort of, because come the patient loss to follow up is another major challenge that all of us as physicians face. So. It, it also overcomes that kind of a problem. So now when we're talking about uh, the screening methodologies, how has it changed for you and how, what is your method to screen patients for cervical health? And over the years with the latest technologies as well, how has the practice changed for you? So now in the initial uh, years, what we did basically was that um, as gynecologists, we know that every woman who comes to the gynec clinic, if at all possible, we would do a pap smear. We do not want to lose that contact. So we would do a pap smear and then, you know, we would follow up. 
But um, in now, of course, what we do is that if when we look at the cervix in my clinic, what I do is if I look at the cervix and it looks suspicious, I would just do the pap smear anyway, but also follow up with an EVA, which means that if I put acetobite and I find an acetobite area, if I put acetic acid and I find an acetobite area that is the change in color, it blanches, then I, I would probably, if I think it's suspicious, I would take a biopsy from it at the same sitting with the consent of the patient. Now that's very important. So if the patient says it's okay to do it, then I would take a biopsy and I would send it across. So at one shot, everything is over. If that is not possible, then at a later date, I would, uh, I would uh, uh, sort of schedule uh, uh, an examination with the EVA and then call her in and do the same thing. So that would actually what that Thank means. Thank you so much. Ma. Yeah, yeah. So then what it means basically is that you save a lot of time and uh, you definitely do not lose the follow-up that you have for the patient. And um, that, that is useful. Mr. Ganesh Prasad, as a technology company, what is your view towards the prevention of uh, cervical cancer? So absolutely. I think uh, not just in cervical cancer, but as a technology company, I fundamentally believe that anything we bring in as technology should solve for a problem, should help the clinician to be able to quickly diagnose and start treatment. You know, that's the whole purpose of uh, bringing in technology in healthcare. So now, of course, now focusing on cancer, especially on women's health, if you really see, uh, you know, uh, as uh, Dr. Vijaya said, you know, cervical cancer is something which is uh, unseen. And uh, it's very important that, you know, uh, we bring in a device and not just a device which is complicated to use, but bring in a device at point of care, uh, which can, uh, which, which uh, aligns to the workflow, which is, uh, can be used in low resource settings as well. And uh, also, if possible, uh, you know, bring in an ability to connect to an expert to be able to support with an, uh, with an assessment. And uh, we have gone, the mobile ODT team uh, who's uh, created this technology has gone one step more. And in fact, uh, they have brought in the AI layer as well to be able to, Dr. Narendra explained this. He was one of uh, uh, those, you know, who evaluated uh, this AI and participated in this global, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, global collaboration to make sure that uh, we do, we, we are able to identify the right problems and uh, make sure that the AI, uh, you know, works efficiently. So uh, that's another thing which has come in as an additional layer. So effectively as a technology company, what am I supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? We have to be responsible about bringing a solution uh, for a problem, not making the technology a problem. We are responsible about making it, you know, uh, 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 very, very ubiquitous. When I say ubiquitous, you know, at point of care, uh, we have to make it, we have to demystify the use uh, fundamentally that anyone can use it. Uh, Dr. Narendra was just uh, very nice of him to show the product itself. You can see the product is just a, it's like a mobile phone and a camera on it and a light source on it. And, you know, you just point on the cervix. Of course, you know, uh, like uh, Dr. Vijaya said, uh, the paramedics can be trained to put a speculum, uh, you know, put acetic acid and then uh, look at the, uh, you know, look at the cervix and then take a picture and they take the picture. They obviously, they can share it. Uh, the AI layer can help you to give. So we are completely looking at end-to-end -end solving for the physician problem, which is quickly identifying, diagnosing, and starting treatment. So that's my outlook of how we should. And definitely in, uh, you know, cancer, uh, which can be prevented, you know, cervical cancer is, can be prevented, uh, you know, uh, seeing it early and making sure that it doesn't progress is a huge help. And uh, I think uh, this plays a very significant role. And I should say in the last three years, uh, we've done significant process, progress, great adoption. Uh, this device now is available in length and breadth of the country, uh, tie two, tie three, tie four, low resource settings. I'm sure very soon government will take notice of this and include this in their program. Gynecologists are, uh, you know, I'm so glad, glad that uh, one, of, one of my close friends, gynecologist said, it's a gynec telescope. So I love that, you know, I loved her saying that, you know, come on, Ganesh, this is not a device, it's a gynec stethoscope. And that's how tight it is. So that's that's my view on what should technology be. End of the day, it should help the physician focus on the problem, diagnose accurately, 
do a treatment, uh, you know, that has, uh, you know, the, that, that is a clear evidence, evidence-based treatment. So, so as you mentioned how things are working, how are you working towards building awareness and what do you think are the challenges when you work towards developing a technology for something as crucial as cervical cancer? Obviously, the uh, see, we can't say that people are uh, doctors are not aware of what's the uh, you know method to uh, look at or treat. Okay, when we are bringing in a disruption in technology as this, uh, we can't let uh, it to be known by doctors by themselves. You know, I firmly believe that we have a huge responsibility as a technology company to promote awareness. I don't believe in advertisement at all. Uh, you know, but awareness is important. There's a big difference between advertisement and awareness. Awareness is bringing out the value of such, bringing out the differentiating value of such, bringing out the impact that this makes in terms of, you know, reducing, uh, you know, mortality and, you know, improving uh, clinical outcomes. So uh, we've done, a, we've done a lot of, thankfully, I think we have uh, friends like Dr. Narendra, we have friends like Dr. Vijaya, Dr. Malika, you know, Dr. Foxy chairman, you know, a big influencer in the government. Obviously, you know, Dr. Malika very early in the Apollo research program incubated us, you know, uh, made a lot of effort to uh, bring in evidence to prove that, you know, this product value because you know we are, whom are we fighting uh, we are fighting you know you remember this you know we fight we are fighting the large equipment you know the same colposcope was available which was filling half your room it was like uh, the olden days of we used to have our big uh, you know transistor sets or our telephones or our big mobile phones this device was fighting that and you know and uh, to believe that a device as this can be at least as impactful as, as that it's not easy for anyone to accept and that's where we have help from you know uh, our friends in the community who i mean healthcare community who uh, we have worked for many many years together and they trust us they support us they prove the evidence they prove that these bring a value to the physician practice and after that obviously you know the uh, we have to take it across the length and breadth and the second fundamental thing when i say awareness is training so it's not that, you know, I just give a device and then say, it's your problem. Even as simple a device as this, you know, it's like this, you know, I always remember when iPhone came in, I was so happy. I wanted to give one to my dad. When I asked him, he said, I don't want this. It's not that he was averse to using it, but he was not, you know, ready to use that at that point in time. So it's very important to say that it's not as complex as what any one of you may think because it is small. It's so compact, but, you know, it solves for a lot of complexities. So that's the training that we have to bring in. And of course, the clinical training and uh, which we have to participate with various forums as this. Uh, in association with ICCP, we did a good program. You know, we continuously do this uh, seminars. We participate in almost almost all uh, events, Foxy events. Uh, we uh, you know share the product. We allow uh, them to use it. You know, demonstrate it, bring the value. Uh, of course, these are all things that we have to do. You know, to build awareness. Awareness obviously cannot be just you know talking about the problem and leaving the solution, and also to be participating with the customers to prove as to how we can solve for and uh, that brings in more adoption <laughs> that brings in more adoption and uh, that's my view of how we can participate and we certainly believe in doing that uh, we've done that over many years we did it for the ultrasound uh, dr narendra knows this very well uh, when uh, you know for over two three decades we've been doing it with dr narendra and of course for any device i certainly believe that that's the value we can bring in as a company we just can't be a transaction agent we have to be uh, completely inclusive in terms of of, uh, you know, participating, you know, with the, to make sure that the end use of it is realized. Thank you, Mr. Ganesh. And we really hope that uh, uh, all that you hope for and uh, you do achieve it. Uh, we also have Dr. Alexandra. Uh, Dr. Alexandra, what is the role of visual check and how has it helped you in your clinical practice? So, uh, hello, um, hello from Europe. Um, uh, I'm not very familiar with the screening programs in India, but we are. Uh, I'm working at tertiary center in an academic hospital. So, uh, we are currently testing Eva in two ways. One of uh, them was mentioned similarly by Dr. Malika. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing it correctly. That's right. So that would be the role of Eva in a regular screening outpatient care 
suburbs somewhere in the middle of the country where not maybe all doctors are familiar with the screening programs. And the other way we are also testing how it can help with the very advanced teaching hospital centers where we already have patients uh, directed to us with the pre-diagnosed pathology and is, is that of any help? I mean the EVA and the quality of the picture that you described so, so perfectly. So uh, in Poland we have a very precise screening program so we don't really have the problem of pap smear. We are currently more uh, fighting for making the LBC and HPV testing more available. The pap smear is a, is a routine. Uh, but we are are uh, trying to prove and we, I think we are succeeding in, in showing that EVA actually is an additional tool that can help you with the pap smear. So as a first step of more advanced uh, expert opinion at your fingertips. So we are, uh, we are testing and working with it and treating it as our senior consultant next to a very basic resident or even maybe a midwife uh, that after a regular screening after taking the pap smear just adding acidic acid waiting 30 seconds the eva even counts the seconds for us so that's just you don't have to think about it and then uh, she rules good or bad green light or red light as as dr malika mentioned so uh, we are we are checking how accurate the eva ruling is uh, and then retesting patients taking biopsies if the red light appeared so uh, we we are treating the the eva device and the mobile odt system as a kind of additional help the the expert opinion uh, when the expert is not available just next door to to ask him or her and currently we can see that actually she's really good at picking up those curious cases where you thought that maybe the cervix looked good, there was no whitening, there was nothing, and she saw something, then we are retesting the patient or the patient is directed to us as I'm working in a cervical uh, pathology department. And then, yeah, there, there is something and, and the histopathology is actually confirming that. And as all the doctors uh, and distinguished guests here confirmed the most important thing is to catch those patients early at the pre-invasive uh, stages the uh, preferably h cell or l cell or how 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 soon and the, the sooner the better so or even with just the hpv positive high risk hpv and just uh, warning her to to get a regular checkups and if we get that we basically saved her life so that's that's the goal and i'm pretty sure that every additional tool uh, in our country additional to cytology so i wouldn't replace the pap smear or lbc or co-test with the with eva but i assume that there are different different um, nece necessary uh, additional ads in different parts of countries and different countries but adding it to a regular screening just simply improves the the quality of the medical consultation that you are giving to the patient and uh, making her being diagnosed with the cancer sooner saves her life. So that's how Eva helps us. She gives us the red light when not every doctor, especially not the advanced colposcopist would see the red light before, before he notices it, Eva notices it and we just do the rest. We test her, we take the biopsy and we, we just follow with the guidelines. So. I think that's that's the most important thing. It it really can every year counts in the matter of the cancer progression. So this year, one year, two years saved. I, I cannot say the, precisely how many, but any even months can help. So that's what Eva does. So if you had to highlight the major advantages of this. Uh, of having this artificial intelligence in uh, cervical health screening devices, what would those be? Uh, that's what what Dr. Narenda said. It's 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 tiny. It's very high quality. It's packed with technology. Um, from for for us with many patients in the hospitals or in our private practice, it's important that it works fast. It doesn't need you to to prolong your visit because it takes thirty seconds for acidic acid to work. Also, it doesn't stain your workplace with different uh, different stains that we we also use sometimes iodine and so on and so on. And just acidic acid is pretty clear and and safe. I would say easy to to clean. Uh, and after thirty seconds. Uh, 
um, you don't even need to touch the device to take the photo. You just wave and it takes the perfect quality, high resolution photo that you can um, analyze yourself. You can then uh, view not only on the screen on the device, but you can see it uh, on your laptop or your computer or on your uh, TV even if you do want probably and uh, you can analyze it yourself. You can send it to your colleagues, experts uh, in, the, in the colposcopy field um, and you can also partially at least because it's in the trial so I cannot say you can rely 100% but hopefully you will be able to rely on the decision of this artificial intelligence, the mysterious cloud ruling uh, god of colposcopy who really is very simple to interpret because it's either red light or green light so there's nothing simpler than that. So that that's I think what what's what's what are the main advantages? Fast, not messy, reliable, uh, doesn't require you to prolong your visit, and you get the answer immediately. You don't need to wait for your histopathology result. So I, I would say these are the top five. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Zimmer, for beautifully explaining those. Coming back to you, Dr. Vijaya. Talking about prevention of cervical cancer, where is India on WHO and Ministry of Health guidelines and initiatives? I said earlier, the doctors, uh, we are concentrating only on the, uh, started with the village side, because from the primary health center, we are to start a screening. So we started training our nurses on um, uh, uh, CN Street program, where we did the speculum examination and see any obvious growth, or ultimately they will refer. Uh, but the thing is, uh, using them, earlier we started with Avaya and Vilay, uh, both uh, acetic acid and Lugal's iodine. Now we have uh, stopped that Vilay. Uh, we are doing only Vaya with acetic acid, 5% acetic acid. And we trained our staff nurses to identify the acetovite patches. And then they will immediately refer them to a nearby district headquarters hospital. Uh, almost all of the Tamil Nadu district headquarters and medical colleges are provided with colposcopy and uh, immediately they will be sent and we'll be, we will issue them an ID card uh, with their number and uh, so that it will be centralized. Uh, we can follow the patient. Most important is following up the pre-invasive uh, cervical lesion uh, because it's a long journey uh, from the pre-invasive to become a cancer cervix. Uh, it takes almost 10 years. Uh, we have that much of opportunity to catch the patient before they become cancerous. So the follow-up is very, very important. And the another interesting thing is this colposcopy program has come under the PM insurance. So if the patient has the insurance card, automatically they need not pay even a single pie. And the subsequent treatment will be very, very free for them, like cryo or leap, whatever procedure we are doing for a pre-invasive lesion. Um, so the only disadvantage is the colposcopy. Uh, what we have is a, a digital colposcope, manual as well as the, the video colposcope. Um, it is not handy. That is the only thing. It is uh, very fragile. Suppose if we drop it, what happens? Like an I, I, uh, iPhone. It's uh, that is a, uh, all my assistants before I came into the panel. I just uh, called them and asked them, How are you satisfied with the Ziva and uh, uh, hand colposcope? So that it is very, very easy to screen and uh, treat the patient. And we can even take them for camps uh, uh, instead of taking our uh, manual colposcope. The only thing they were telling is uh, it was very, very fragile. Suppose we drop it by mistake, that's all. The entire thing is gone. That is the only thing they were telling. Otherwise, the picture and everything, they were clear. They were very happy about that. So I just want to discuss about this, that later, uh, sir. Uh, so apart from this, uh, uh, this insurance coverage and following up uh, and giving them a separate ID card. That is the thing we are doing in the government. So following, uh, following up is something that is really important when it comes to cancer care. Uh, coming to Dr. Malaika, do, what, what are the do's and don'ts in prevention of cervical cancer, according to you? Yeah, the do's and don'ts of... Um... Uh, you know, screening for cervical cancer is probably what you mean. Um, now, the important thing for us to know is that the recommended age for screening is from 21 to 65. Now, why 21, why 65? We say 21 because we know that even if um, a person has been sexually active in their teens, it would still take about 10 years for a lesion to appear. And therefore, to do it before that will not make sense. 
At the same time, if you do it, um, you need not do it after 65 because if a person has had um, pap smears or screenings which are negative, for instance, if you have a pap smear which is uh, negative for malignancy or they are negative for HPV, at the age of 65, they have ha never had a precancerous lesion, then there is no need to screen after 65. So that's the age criteria that we need to remember. But we also need to remember that if a person is uh, immunocompromised, they are diabetic, or they have any history of having consumed DES, in all of these cases, then the interval of uh, screening would be more uh, frequent. So that's one thing about the do's uh, and um, the other thing is that in pregnancy, do we screen or do we not screen? So this is an issue which all of us face as clinicians. Um, I am reluctant to do a pap smear when a woman comes with her pregnancy in the first visit because I don't think her parents, would, her mother would like it and neither would the patient like it because they are very protective uh, of her condition right then. But um, it is recommended that women, because the reproductive age group is the time when cervical cancer actually presents, that it can be done during pregnancy, when they come for their first visit during pregnancy. So the other thing is, uh, can pap smears be done when a person is menstruating? It is better to avoid, avoid having a pap smear when you're doing uh, when a person is in a period, because it would definitely confuse the picture. Um, there are many other things that we need to watch out for. Um, that is, how do you keep doing a pap smear every year? No, you don't. If a woman has had a pap smear which is negative, um, she you can repeat the pap smear after three years. If you're doing a HPV, or a self pap, you could do a, a repeat uh, after five years. Um, whereas if you do a pap smear and um, and and a pap smear is coming out uh, not positive, not negative, but ascus, then you have to triage with another modality of screening, like you can do a HPV also along with the pap, and then take it on from there. So. These are the conditions that we uh, think about screening and um, uh, screening as, uh, you know, with these guidelines and these guidelines that have been actually um, set up by uh, the, the American College of Cancer of Corpus Corpus, as well as the GCPR of FOXI, that is the good clinical practice of FOXI guidelines. So um, that would be the do's and don'ts that we would think about when we're doing cervical screening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all the experts for sharing their views. Now, uh, we have a set of questions that we've received from our attendees. So uh, without wasting any time, I'll now be beginning with the Q&A and these will be open to all speakers. So uh, the first question is, is cancer screening there in any of the maternal health programs or adolescent health programs? So yes, uh, the government has a cancer service, but they have it only with the visual examination at the periphery. And now they've provided colposcopes to all the medical colleges. And uh, so the colposcopic at the medical colleges also uh, would have a program. So it is in a cancer screening program, yes. We have VIA, that is visual inspection with aesthetic as well. That is there in the villages. Colposcopes are not there. Uh, but then uh, screening the college going girls or uh, talking about the HPV vaccination, of course we do because that is very, very important because that is not taken off in India because of the few side effects when the vaccination has started, few of the cases had nausea, vomiting and giddiness. So they stopped the HPV vaccination. Now the government is into bringing the HPV vaccination and Foxy is also supporting, isn't it, sir? So, so we did this in 2018 when my wife, Dr. Jerry, was the president of Foxy. Uh, the whole new program of uh, screen the mother, vaccinate the daughter started. Yes, sir. And, uh, and it started from Varanasi just after the Foxy Bangalore Congress. And uh, when we said there was a, 
uh, economic forum which was uh, uh, funding the whole program but when we went to the government they have the sampurna clinics and these sampurna clinics in uttar pradesh are only cancer screening free clinics and vaccinating and they bought these sampurna clinics have brought huge doses huge amount of doses of cancer cervix vaccine but they did not know how to give it so foxy helped that and we have uh, since 2018 we are now in uttar pradesh uh, vaccinating all the girls when these mothers come with the girls so we started screening the mothers by via or teaching the sampurna clinic uh, uh, worker there screen the mother put a speculum put acid or acetic acid see look at it if you have a cal- colposcope there do a colposcopy and vaccinate uh, give the shot to the daughter and bring another one or your neighbor the next time so it's a very good program and it's running pretty well in uttar pradesh now thank you dr narendra the second question is are there training programs on cervical cancer given to nurses and on awareness trainings to asha workers so well uh, foxy as a society has training programs on colposcopy and cancer screening uh, through its committee for the doctors for foxy members 38000 gynecologists not see even mbbs if you're not a foxy member you can be a foxy member as mbbs the, the type 2 member non voting so you could uh, get a 6 months uh, fellowship program in foxy or a 15 day orientation course for nurses and um, for the gynecologists have not yet officially started though we are when we train the nurses under the manyata program for obstetric care we do tell them about uh, perspeculum examination of the cervix and all that things but i don't think we have a formal program running from foxy i think the government does run a program on uh, with asha okay. asha workers yes dr vijay is saying yes yeah national okay. health mission yeah that national health mission sorry sir national health mission has uh, taken up the program to train the nurses we are into treating the pre invasive detecting and invading in treating the pre invasive lesion so all our nurses are trained there are separate uh, staff nurses uh, paid by the uh, ncd wing of nhm uh, so the payment and the salary and the training everything is taken care by the national health mission so they do it with uh, only examination by the speculum now and if you have this device if we have this device this nurse will just has to put put the device at the speculum get a picture send that picture to the expert to vijaya to um, uh, aims to anywhere to us or a, or a team who looks after and that's it it becomes so simple so i think we need to take technology to where it is needed most yes, that sir. is at the periphery and if this if the technology remains only in bombay delhi goa no bombay delhi bangalore then then it's of no use here we are already aware we are doing paps lvcs we are doing direct to uh, uh, direct to slide test which are the most advanced test but this is needed where where it this is to be done where it is needed and fragile yes everything is fragile if i drop my phone whatever it is is going to break so if you drop a big colposcope it is going to break so you have to be careful of not dropping if you drop your spectacles they will break so the things are fragile good things are always fragile good things are always fragile yes <laughs> <laughs> so the next question is for Dr. Malika. How yeah, frequently Malika, should we, sorry, it's Malika. Okay. okay. How frequently should uh, a woman get screened for cervical cancer, and is the incidence more in the particular age, in any particular age, Ms. Malika? Yeah. Okay. So as I was saying, um, a woman should get screened once in every three years. if her screening is negative for cancer now um, if on the other hand she has a lsi or a low, or a low grade lesion or a hsi then the screening would differ according to her condition so um, and uh, if uh, if on the other hand if she is having a hpv test then she can do it once in every 5 years if you're immunocompromised then you would do it more frequently maybe every year uh, um uh, that's that's it and you know the thing is that um screening is so important i don't know how we could emphasize to our country um to everyone uh, who we could reach that 
screening is important because um, like all our speakers have said that in the in 2018 there were about uh, a lack and and some people who actually had the disease of cervical cancer and about 67,000 of them who actually succumbed and died. And in spite of this scenario, only about 3.1% of our population of women um, who actually fall into this age group of 21 and 65 are actually getting screened, which is such a sad thing, you know. And I just wish that we could do more towards uh, getting people screened. Um, so having said that, I, I'm just wondering how we could probably, I know that there are a lot of NGO organizations who are dealing with cervical screening. Um, we met some of them in Hyderabad. There are some in Delhi and there's some uh, around those areas. And I, I'm sure they're pretty much um, uh, all over India. And so that, you know, it takes the load off the government to some extent. And um, yeah, and so this is so important for us to actually screen um, at a regular interval. Actually, in the government setup, we have stopped uh, taking a pap smear because uh, especially in the peripheries, uh, we need a cytologist. Uh, so there is lack of uh, manpower. So we depend only on via. Uh, so and magnavision, which will enable, magnify the cervix uh, and the staff nurses can see through the magnavision. And now this colposcope has come and uh, it's a very, very good idea. We can take it to the interior part of the states and then we can train the staff nurses. And along with the FOGSI, we, the medical college gynecologists, we will be interested to teach, uh, uh, train the staff nurses. It is a very good uh, innovative thing. And also the HPV testing, we cannot afford at the at, at, at the present moment. So if the HPV testing is also a little costly. And uh, that these are the two drawbacks we have uh, about this pap smear and uh, this uh, HPV testing. We don't do the routine yeah. HPV test. Um, Dr. Vijay, like you said, if, if only the EVA could be um, distributed in the primary health centers, because I know that your primary health centers have a wonderful program for screening. And like you said, Vilay, because I've had some patients of mine who are working, who are doctors in primary health centers, and then they tell us about uh, the programs that you have. And if only they also had the EVA, it would be so good, you know, it would really benefit their uh, diagnosis uh, making. So yeah, anything easy is always welcome. Uh, so instead of uh, carrying that manual colposcope and digital colposcope, uh, anything handy and which can give you the same result as a, a bigger one is uh, always welcome. And if you can interpret and also you can WhatsApp or email to the consultant or the expert. So the same moment like uh, ECG, echo sharing and even CT and MRI reports are being screened and shared through WhatsApp only nowadays, even ortho pictures fractures and even all those digital x-rays have come so we should also move a step in advance in gynecology it's a very welcoming move yeah great so uh, the next question is does the technology uh, also detect hpv types behind the precancerous cervical cancer i don't think it uh, detects the types what HPV, HPV yeah. detected only by the HPV test. Yes. So it's a DNA test, basically. Looking at it. Yeah. Not by the cervix. Yeah. So you've got to get, get the, send the smear for HPV, or do a test or whatever, and then you get the HPV load, viral load, and everything, and the which type of HPV is there. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So the uh, there is a next question and also a request along with this. Uh, it says, could you please explain the device and uh, what what is the added benefit if PAP and VA is done? What is the AI component? So you want me to show this device? This, this is what the device is. It's a handheld and it, you, you can put it on the um, stand and it fits in your OPD. So when the patient is lying down, you're doing a per speculum examination and then you just pull the small device right there 
focus focus it in. there is a green filter here apply you get a picture here after you filled up the name and the picture automatically goes to the cloud or to your laptop where a report will be generated uh, from the 500 uh, people who have uh, classified all the pictures possible and it will artificially it will tell you the artificial intelligence will tell you that this could be dysplasia one this could be access this could be uh, precancerous this could be scomiculumina junction abnormality whatever you can modify the diagnosis if you feel the machine is telling you wrong and of course the uh, very simple so you just sit sit uh, with the patient patient's legs are up and this device is right there even by instead of looking straight at the spectrum you can look at the screen and if you look at the screen you get the correct picture of how uh, how uh, accurate your uh, visualization is so it's 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 very very simple to use it's very very handy to use and uh, it, it is very very automatic so every patient what we are now doing is any gynec patient who comes like someone said stethoscope so ultrasound has been a stethoscope for the obstetrician and this has been the stethoscope for the gynecologist because women you know in, in my opd of 100 gynec problems 30 35 would be of bleeding problems 30 35 would be of discharge uh, problem and uh, the rest would be uh, the others other problems of so pid pain etc etc but in all 100 i have to look at the cervix because even if it is bleeding i have to look whether the bleeding is from the cervix so if i get something which can magnify the cervical image for me and give me a tentative diagnosis also what what more can i ask for so it just simplifies my job and makes it easy and makes it very quick otherwise what i do a speculum then send her into the colposcope room which cannot be in your opd because your opd is small cramped up you cannot have that big machine here or she you call her back again and then the colposcopist says that this is wrong and then you post her for biopsy here as uh, ziva said you have the red in the clinic immediately tells you a biopsy is needed you can take it there you can do so it's it's exact it's it's wonderful uh, to me uh, what what we are experiences in the last one and a half years Okay, so the next question is, is this technology being used only in the urban districts? And uh, also, he wants to know, do gynees in district hospitals use these, uh, rural district hospitals also use these technologies? I can partially answer this. Uh, adoption in private uh, as, uh, really, uh, is much, much, much more stronger, I should say, in the rural districts. Uh, because absolutely, these rural districts are places where they want quick evidence to start treatment. And uh, I'm so overwhelmed by the kind of response we have had in the tier two, tier three towns across the country. I just said this even earlier. Obviously, on the government side, uh, district headquarters, hospitals, I mean, I'm sure someone can answer. So in the, in the government hospitals and district hospitals, I don't think we have uh, the artificial intelligence technology. We so we have the, you no, know, we don't have. So we have the video colposcopes, which is also technology, and uh, it gives you records of video, and uh, on the colposcope uh, on the screen, and you you have to analyze it yourself or take no, an we opinion. We can connect. No, we can connect it to the computer, sir, and a laptop, and then we can send the uh, pictures. Yeah. To so you can send the pictures and get it connected as we get. Okay, so uh, there is a, another question. Is there any other device that is available to screen cervical health screening with AI? There's none. Uh, there's none with AI. Even with the EVA, it's just that uh, we just about launching it. Dr. Simon said it's in the late end of the trials, and uh, we just concluded the trials, and we are just starting to commercialize this. So there's none, you know, the, the several facets where you has, uh, you know, taken an early lead, uh, you know, the company which is making this mobile ODT has taken an early lead uh, is uh, to completely understand, you know, the problem, you know, that they're solving for and walking towards it, you know, using technology. So one fundamentally is, uh, you know, looking at how a mobile can be, mobile phone, a mobile device can be used, you know, along with the, uh, lens and the light source to be able to make it you know at point of care as ubiquitous as it can be 
The second, obviously, is to answer to Dr. Vijay's question and to Vijay's point, uh, and of course, the question which came up. Uh, you know, they have designed a beautiful stand. You know, uh, you know, to make sure that you know it's rests on the stand, uh, and the stand is as portable as well. You can just fold. It's like a tripod. You could just fold it, and you can take it, and you can hold it on that, so that the chances of dropping, the chances of dropping it during an exam is when it is the highest. You know, so that's taken care as well. And uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, there's a very good case, you know, to transport, so that you know you don't have to worry about the breakage during the transit. So that's a very interesting thing. And when they realize that you know this device was gaining traction and you know a lot of interest across the world they quickly you know brought in ai and not just for you know saying is a problem or no problem you need to help to ensure that the first thing that the ai does is to show that the image you have taken is good enough that's the first thing you know because somebody should know that the image i have taken is it good enough for me to be able to make a diagnosis on it if it does if the image is not good enough it's not going to you know uh, go to the next step so that's another very interesting you know way of you know making sure that the picture that you have taken is the right picture to take and you are not making even sure that you have to click something you just wave it wave and then you know it clicks when you look at the cervix when you are okay with the image you wave and it clicks and uh, then even then to make sure that you know it's the right picture or you have to take another picture the right picture then it gives you an early evidence dr simmer said this very beautifully so even before we could figure this out the uh, eva here the visual check figures it out and tells us come on there's some problem look at it now don't let it go and uh, you know this is a very very interesting this product has been so beautifully thoughtfully uh, designed uh, you know its workflow uh, ease of use and of course the uh, advances and i clearly don't think that there's anything today as comprehensive as this uh, you know available uh, you know for uh, visual check i just want to add uh, to doc, what uh, to mr ganesh has been saying um you know the national uh, cancer association in the us um they are the ones who actually worked along with modt so uh, what they have said is that you know when you do a pap smear it is just 70% uh, accurate or sensitivity is only about 70% but when you actually get this artificial intelligence um you could get about a 90% um uh, sensitivity and an accuracy in the reporting because uh, they have actually pulled in um suppose you're looking at uh, hsil or cin2 they've pulled in so many images and then studied it uh, with the computer technology and uh, like ganesh was saying the first thing that the um, uh, the artificial intelligence will do or the um, ape will do is actually to see if this is cervical tissue and just like the pethesta system of uh, of of um, uh, screening uh, it will tell you whether the specimen is adequate isn't it and then only it will start um, the next thing which is to actually say whether you know the which, which is actually to detect any hot spots on your screen so i think that is really amazing while cervical tests and screenings are being done are there any issues that you face due to lack of standards in the system yeah very much the really days because sir i'll answer sir after yeah, that please, yeah, please please yeah Uh, because uh, it uh, needs lot of training and practice uh, everything will look uh, become abnormal and will look abnormal when you magnify and see it will be very scary even uh, this uh, spermal column junction the transformation zone the new one the old one what you do if you don't see the transformation zone to make them clear and understanding you need to go on seeing the colposcopic pictures and slowly only you will get used this is normal this is abnormal so it takes a really a lot of time you cannot because everything will become ab look abnormal doesn't matter even for the staff nurses even if it looks abnormal they can as i said they can Uh, transport the pictures to us uh, and we will give them the correct uh, idea or the diagnosis so it uh, really needs a good experience to interpret the colposcopic pictures uh, because we ourselves save so many doubtful pictures and uh, get to uh, i mean uh, discuss with our uh, own colleagues and uh, colposcopists and then come to a diagnosis so it's not that easy to interpret a colposcopic picture i'm sure on that 
Absolutely. I was just adding to that. Uh, thanks, Dr. Vijaya, for taking the lead and answering this question. You know, the whole effort should be to reduce the learning curve. You know, because everything needs learning. Without learning, you can't absolutely say that. You know, I'm, I can, I can have an, I have an evidence. But in my view, uh, the way this product is designed, the way the visual check is designed, uh, terrifically shortens the learning curve, uh, and thus absolutely something which uh, uh, you know is going to make more adoption. You know, adoption is always the fear that am I overseeing something? Am I not seeing something? Uh, so now, if the system through its uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence can shorten the learning curve to give you that confidence, that expands adoption. So the, the, those those are considered in this equipment. So which is what I wanted to share. So the next question is also for you, uh, Mr. Ganesh. Uh, someone wants to know: Does this uh, device needs to be connected to a computer software, especially in rural areas? Example in uh, distance screening camps. No, you don't have to. This is this itself is like an handphone. You know, it's like a device. So right, you know, you can just push it from the uh, you know the device itself. And you know, at the receiving end, obviously, you know, they should have a device. They should have a uh, you know ability to be able to see it. You know, they can have a you know computer or whatever. But at the transmitting end, it is just this device. There is nothing else that's needed beyond this device. Okay. Uh, is it, the, next... um, the picture is transferable through WhatsApp. This directly goes, madam. You don't uh, WhatsApp uh, interface is not even needed because you can just push this to uh, whomever you are you know, connected in the system. So uh, uh, WhatsApp, uh, we can't do a WhatsApp from the uh, device. Uh, that's not possible. You can uh, make the pictures, isn't it? Yeah, 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 correct. Yeah, you can mail it, you can put it on the cloud. You can yeah, yeah, we can mail it. We can't WhatsApp it. We can put okay. it on the cloud and you can pick it from there, yeah. The next question is, uh, how cost effective is this for the patient? Dr. Narendra said he's not charging any, so <laughs> it can be it can be as low as that. So, uh, so you're going to give uh, supply freely to all of us? Why not? Uh, for for, Tam for Tamil Nadu government, we'll work out a program. <laughs> so <laughs> okay, I, I I come from there, so let's work out something. <laughs> okay. In, uh, I, as far as uh, when I introduced uh, Eva into Apollo First Med Hospital. Um, I had the cooperation of my, um, what do you call it, the GM there. So I had put it at a very low cost. So I we charge, I think, uh, 600 rupees uh, for, a, for the device screening. And then, of course, the extra things, the treatment room charges, that, that will be there. So, but oh. it, is a, it is a very low cost compared uh, to... Yeah, another, another suggestion is... Uh... Yeah, after, after you, madam. Uh, another suggestion is you can incorporate into the master health program checkup in what Tamil Nadu government is having in almost all the uh, government hospitals. Uh, it could be done at a lower cost. It will be uh, really helpful in screening, uh, Mr. Ganesh. Absolutely, madam. I think we should work together on this. Okay. I think uh, we should. I, I will come and meet you and uh, okay. let's see how to put this together. That would really be good. I mean, if this could be incorporated into the government and then slowly and into then it goes medical centers that would be the best that thing that would be the best because it's, it has to go where it is needed absolutely absolutely, absolutely. So what what i am doing is i've got this uh, tripod on my opd um, and I, as i do a for a speculum i just take a picture just for my sake just to magnify it yeah and the patient further needs uh, a reporting and everything then she has to pay 500 bucks for so that is how we are doing otherwise we are looking at all the service through this uh, without uh, charging anything, it comes in the consultation fee. Oh, that's that's very good. Do you do it even during the Corona times? Are you brave enough to? Uh, we were the only <laughs> hospital in Agra working in Corona times <laughs> as a non-COVID hospital, so we did we did have to work. Though the women did, I mean, suddenly all the women's diseases vanished. Huh? They all got well. Yeah. I know <laughs> that's what <laughs> I'm glad. No, that one, one, the one, same one, thing. One one interesting thing, Dr. Malika, this Corona times, you know, gives me a perspective to this. You know, uh, we have to. If the, the if the doctor had to, you know, be evaluated into to be doing this procedure, yeah, you know, this is a trained staff nurse doing it. Yeah, they can be on a PPE. You know, they can be safe, and the picture <laughs> yeah. can be transferred. 
Now, just yeah. imagine if you know the doctor had to do it and not the nurse or not the yeah. paramedic. You know, it would be even more difficult. You know, so 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 the way that it is ubiquitous, the way it's you, you can be used by a staff nurse. You know, who can obviously be completely protected with the PPE, and uh, you know she can use it, and uh, the specialist can remotely look at it. Mm -hmm. AI comes in handy to make sure that you know we're not missing anything. Uh, so it's a you know I think even during Corona or post Corona times, probably you know uh, this this is even more uh, user friendly. Uh, yeah. You know, and uh, you know, can uh, can make sure that we don't miss. I definitely don't believe that women uh, women problems have gone down. Women don't normally tell their problems during Corona. Probably they're not at all telling. So that's the only thing. So that that we should not take that as the. Uh, I don't want to take that as the uh, uh, you know way out. But uh, certainly we have to promote this. Women wellness is paramount, and uh, awareness uh, you know towards women's wellness devices has this. And these are not just devices which talk about a problem. You know, we have a solution. We have government programs. We have an easy solution. Uh, prevention as an opportunity. How do we miss this? So we should not at all. Absolutely. But talking about PPEs, I think uh, even we have got fed up of wearing PPEs. So now yes. even during surgery, um, we just wear a face shield with an N95 and hope for the best, you know. <laughs> So, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the next question is, what are the limiting factors to doctors in adopting the system? First, they have to buy the machine. <laughs> every, everyone, everyone, feels, everyone feels everything is expensive. So, so Danesh has to do something for that. Yeah. And, and of Absolutely. course, the learning, yeah, I, I the, totally the agree. Learning curve I is not too great. Learning curve is not too great or too big. So it's very easy to learn. And then the second thing which our gynecs uh, are is that they they are even in the medical colleges, district hospital, and even in private, the workload work is too much. So people are seeing 40, 50 patients every day uh, in six hours or seven hours. So it's like quick lie down. It's uh, we took a we, we did a survey and we saw that for a pregnant woman, Indian gynecologists see them only for two minutes average. That's no use at all. So that's 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 the another limiting factor. So you got to if you want to give good services, you got to give good time to the patient. So don't see. I, I'm sure in Europe you don't see more than ten patients a day. Zimmer. We do. You, you do. do? <laughs> how, how many patients do you see per in in an OP in an outpatient? Uh, well, it depends on the timing. It probably depends on the private care and uh, the public okay. one. Okay. But so, it is approximately thirty to fifty patients a day, I would say. Wow. But it, it no, this is, it's this not is six the hours. Department. We usually work longer person. hours. Okay. Zimmer, Zimmer, is it a single person seeing fifty patients? Uh, my personal record was around 40 something. So yeah, okay. but, but we don't work so just are, six hours. We usually prolong the hours. Yeah. We are seeing 50 plus every day, 365 days a year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how do these doctors uh, uh, try for 10, 20 minutes? Uh, so that, that mindset has to change. So interestingly, Dr. Uh, Dr. Narendra, I think this brings us to a very important point. You know, uh, gone are the days when, you know, uh, you know, obstetricians and gynecologists used to almost do everything right from temperature, checking temperature to checking the blood so pressure. That is exactly, you have to build up your paramedical yeah, absolutely, uh, right. training so yeah. well that half of the, your work should have been, should do, uh, the yeah, nurses yeah. and your so, assistant should be doing. Yeah, so when you make it as a protocol. You are an expert, you are an expert so all these things should be done and then come to you or on your screen. That is exactly what we have been talking about. Yeah, because we have to just make it as a protocol, make sure that during the waiting time, there's somebody who's checking all this and you have everything on the on your desktop. And when the patient comes, you almost know everything uh, that you have to look out for. And devices has this gives you the opportunity to do that. Just imagine a paramedic doing a big colposcopic examination and then sending. It's not going to work at all. But devices like this can be used. You know, so we have to leverage, we have to change the time, change our protocols, make it seamlessly integrated in workflow and free up time for gynecologists and specialists. 
Absolutely. I think that would be a great idea. Well, uh, that brings us to the end of a Q&A session. And uh, now that we are indeed, uh, we have indeed witnessed a very insightful session with a lot of takeaways on importance of screening and how use of newer technologies and uh, how these are actually helping us in faster detection and prevention of cervical cancer. A question and a special request to all the speakers before we conclude in sync with the multiple efforts that you have been doing on reducing cervical cancer, what would, what would be your one message uh, to the people who are watching us today? Starting with you, Dr. Narendra. I thought we'd start with this. For, uh, foreign, uh, Dr. Zimmer, I think. Okay, if you want me to go. So my, my take is that women have what we call as her unspoken problems. And a lot of time you have to bring out these problems by talking to them. So you need to be very empathetic, sympathetic towards them and try to bring out these problems. And for cancer cervix, I would say, uh, screen the mother, vaccinate the daughter. Then only by 2030, uh, which is our goal in the SDGs, we could bring down or uh, finish off cancer cervix. Now this is two of the cancers which we can, by vaccinating, eliminate. The liver cancer by hepatitis B vaccination, and cancer cervix by HPV vaccination. So why don't we do it? Thank you, Dr. Narendra. Uh, Ms. Simmer, uh, Ms. Zimmer, it's, uh, what, what would be your message? I will be happy to be the last one uh, after distinguished professors here, really. I don't mind. So. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Malika. Yeah, actually, uh, my actual heartfelt plea to everyone is uh, please be screened for cervical cancer. You know, um, uh, you can prevent uh, some terrible calamity for yourself, for your whole family, if only you would be screened. And the other thing is also, like Dr. Narendra was saying, get vaccinations. I don't know why uh, people are reluctant. Uh, they say, uh, let us see what happens, you know. Um, there are few people who are willing and happy to get vaccinated, but a lot of them don't want to vaccinate their daughters um, or, you know, go through screening themselves. So my real earnest plea would be, please do this. And, um, and uh, for all doctors who are watching, please engage very actively in cervical screening. And um, also, if you could get an EVA device, uh, let that be a part of your armamentarium. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Malika. Uh, your message, Dr. Vijay. Yeah, being in government service for so long, I definitely want to take this to the interior of uh, Tamil Nadu. I want uh, Tamil Nadu to become the best in everything in India. So I really want uh, everyone to take this as an opportunity to screen our uh, uh, village health nurse, uh, urban health nurse, and the staff nurses uh, to train them in colposcopy. Uh, we would be much happier in cooperating with the FOGSI and also others. Mr. Ganesh, what would be your message? So my message is obviously to the healthcare providers, the doctors, to uh, to not uh, to create it uh, to make it feel easy for the uh, women to be able to think about it as another routine exam you know if you can make it as simple as that you know it's like you know when you call it a gynec stethoscope so it just make them feel like you know you are using a stethoscope on them so they don't they're under no stress or fear about you know a diagnostic procedure so now just imagine uh, you know they have to go to a diagnostic center to do a procedure to do a you know pap smear or whatever versus you're doing at point of care and uh, to be able to treat immediately when there's a solution available and a prevention possible i think we should make it available for everyone that's my uh, that's my my way of looking at it so if it is not we don't have to we can't do much a solution is available and a prevention opportunity is possible so let's make it work uh, we will do our best from our side I'm sure government will do private. I'm sure Foxy will play a significant role. But uh, I think together we can uh, absolutely 
uh, eradicate this. You know, we can make sure that we prevent this, and uh, we don't have to be worrying about mortality rates. We can't be. We, can, we don't. We, we don't even have to. We should not even worry about. You know, uh, cancer rates. You know, everything should be prevented before the cancer itself. Yeah. Finally, your message, Doctor Zemal. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will go for screening. And if you see anything pathological or you're not an expert, uh, just make a fast referral to someone who knows what to do and who takes a histopathology testing. That's the basics. I, I saw a question was, do we treat without it? No, it's, it's the golden standard, but do it fast every minute, day, week counts. That would be it. Thank you. different initiatives taken by the government for implementing cervical uh, If you look at the initiatives which have been started, uh, you have to go way back in 1975 when we started with the cancer program, which uh, focused on strengthening the Apex Cancer Centers. Uh, it was only uh, highlighted in strengthening the capacities of the cancer centers for treatment of the cancers. Uh, there was no program per se for preventive and promotive aspects of the cancer. Then in 1984, uh, the district cancer event uh, program started which where the early detection and uh, the screening program saw some light into that. Then in the early 2000s, then the, the program was further expanded to include uh, more activities uh, right from screening, right from health education, as well as strengthening of this uh, uh, cancer care in the country. Then uh, uh, recently now it has been added as a part and parcel of the NPCBC program that is National Prevention of Cancer Control and Non-Communicable Disease. That is a part and parcel of that. Apart from that nothing much has happened uh, in the uh, uh, detection of the cervical cancer. That uh, in few districts uh, we started with the immunization program in some of the districts uh, way back uh, in the early 2000s. But due to some adverse uh, events, uh, it was stalled. Now again, uh, the, the vaccination program has started in 2016, where you might see that uh, uh, they are now doing in a guarded and a staggered way. Because uh, whenever, if any you know, large-scale program is some adverse events happens, then we have to be going in a very guarded way. Now we see that okay, how it picks up, how the awareness activities, which are already part and parcel of this, uh, 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 they are all picked up. A lot of uh, activities have to be done. The more promising aspect is uh, the upgradation of the sub health centers where the population based screening for uh, this uh, uh, this uh, cervical screening and can happen. The upgradation of the sub health centers into health and wellness centers. We used to have around 170,000 uh, health and sub health centers, which eventually would be upgraded to health and wellness center. With a, uh, with a nurse driven thing, that means the community health officer is uh, essentially a nurse practitioner. And uh, the, so that the, uh, the screening can happen visually as well as the pap smear can also happen. Because cytological screening is very difficult, but the visual screening can now be very much possible at the sub health center. So these are all the efforts which we have been making and see that the, how it uh, moves ahead uh, in the coming days. But it's all still work in progress and we have to see that key how uh, things unfold and how we are able to prevent the, the second leading cause of the death in the country. Question towards you is shed some light on cervical health of the general public and the importance of cervical health screening, especially in the rural areas, because we need it more there. If you look at the rural characteristics right from the fertility, fertility aspect, First, we have to understand the determinants uh, uh, for the uh, reproductive health of the uh, rural population. In the rural areas, if you talk about the age at marriage and age at first conception, so still a lot of work is to be done. That means age at marriage, uh, previously the demographer used to say it is 16, 17. And the age at first conception is also similarly the same, same age. And apart from that, uh, the living condition, the hygienic condition, the talk about the reproductive and the genital hygiene. That is also one of the determinant factors. I just highlighting on the factor before talking about 
what are the challenges that are there in the rural sector. So these are the hygienic practices. So effort has been made to reduce the reproductive uh, infections uh, in the population, right in the urban areas, a lot of things are picked up, but still in the rural areas, the taboos and the practices which are there, a lot of work is to be done in the rural areas as well. Second, apart from that, you look at the uh, the reproductive infections in the, the reproductive age group or the 15 to 45 age group, you will find that the strong contrast between the urban and the rural areas. In the urban areas, people are more aware. But if you come to the peri-urban areas and the slum areas, you find the more worse condition than the rural areas. Okay, that means if we have to take the peri-urban areas, the slum areas and the rural areas uh, in a different kind of a cluster. So that, that kind of approach should be there. The problems in the slum areas are different, the urban areas are different, and the rural areas are different. We have to see that how to handle that. Thing. The other determinants is the number of pregnancies the woman is having. Now the number of children, you can have restriction because of the other services, the medical determination of pregnancy, the contraceptions and other things. But that is also one of the important uh, determinant for uh, uh, the cause of uh, the predisposing cause for this uh, cervical cancer. The other factor is uh, you know, the use of the oral contraceptive. That's it. Because that's very easy to take. But the oral contraceptives, they have been supposed to be associated with the rise in the cancer incidence. Apart from that, there are other factors also. But essentially, for addressing any of the rural areas, for improving, right from improving the general hygiene to the reproductive health, then addressing the issues of uh, age at marriage, the age at this, these are still challenging. These all are compounded with the fact that uh, the evidence for doing changes happening at their uh, genital areas because they are not aware. They think that it's a normal economy now. What, whatever small change they are happening, if you look at the breast, uh, uh, breast cancer awareness, the woman has to do self-examination. Then only she can know whether some changes are there or not. But for the cervical risk, uh, do we have that kind of mechanism? No. Here also awareness as well as uh, at least uh, confiding with the practitioner there at the rural areas, that would be the key. The moment she's having some problems, some abnormal thing, immediately she should be aware enough to go and seek the services. Lot of things are to be done. The ASHA uh, health worker, we are having more than 900,000 ASHA workers across the country. But we have to educate them so that the woman has confidence in sharing their problems with the, the community health worker. They are the women worker, but still there's a lot of hesitation in coming forward and expressing their problem. That's a major thing. If you are able to make dent on this area, that means people can come forward and seek guidance from at least the community health volunteers and then the community health officers uh, in the three positions, the uh, sub health centers as the health and wellness centers. Then a lot can happen into this area. I think I've been able to express myself about the question. This is a very important uh, question which you have asked. Because uh, if you want to, because perhaps smear is one of the established uh, thing, because uh, if you talk about uh, cervical cancer, one of the uh, causative factor is the uh, papilloma virus. Though we have a vaccine against that, but uh, due to some other adverse events, the vaccination is, has not picked up that space which it ought to have. But still, it is not included in the, the national program. Yeah. But uh, pilots are going on. Regarding the screening thing, the, we have to focus on the visual screening because there are better VIP, VIA, and other methods are there. We have to see that ki, how we focus and popularize the visual screening. At least once a while, when the woman is uh, there with the health volunteer, we have to teach the uh, community health volunteer, the ASHA workers, as well as the community health officers in screening of. The woman at least do a visual examination, and if uh, something is adversely found in the visual examination, that can be subjected for pap screening. Going for a pap screening uh, is whether it is cost effective or not. We should be finding ways of making it more effective. Otherwise, cytological uh, things are very expensive. It's not that it can be easily done. For population-based screening, uh, visual screening can happen provided there is capacities that the 
rural level at the worker level so that they can at least feed and bring that person at the, some institution like primary health center or community health center where the pap smear and other facilities can happen so this is a way a lot a lot has to be done on this pap screening and the uh, this otherwise unless the cutting edge which i think that would be is the creating awareness about knowing about the problem then if the problem is there we have to create capacities uh, in the health workers as well as in the community uh, community health officers so that this kind of screening happen apart from that population based screening you have to organize camps it has to be done in an organized way because lot of uh, privacy and other issues are there we have to see that how we organize camps and take the things forward from there so in the bottom line is that the community based screening is the key for uh, preventing this preventable uh, this uh, cervical cancers as a chairperson of foxy what are the challenges that you've come across from patients as well as clinicians in adoption of screening for cervical cancer so as a foxy oncology committee chairperson uh, definitely we have uh, run few surveys across the country to understand the actual scenario uh, prevailing in the community and also we have run pure through one survey for our doctors trying to understand um, the level of understanding regarding the uh, prevention part and the screening part and how they are adopting it into their uh, day to day clinical practice and their role into it so let me first highlight what we actually found in the public survey and um, it was really a eye opening thing for us Uh, though the fact we know that not much uh, advocacy has been done yet when it comes to uh, put through the message that cervical cancer is the only cancer which is a preventable cancer so uh, what we came to know it was some around 4000 ladies across the country from pan india had taken part in this survey and also we ran few av videos in their respective languages and took up the pre uh, post av uh, survey as well to know how far has it really uh, improved their uh, taking up of this uh, screening and vaccination you will be surprised to know that uh, uh, only few i mean it was around 44% of the ladies knew about vaccination something like hpv vaccination is existing in the country and around only 40% had taken up a primary screening um or might be they would have taken up a screening because they had some problem but not many people around only 30% knew that primary screening is done for those ladies who are symptomless so moving up from here we really um have to play a lot of role uh in you know uh, focusing this matter that it is not only the people who have the disease or symptoms come forward for a screening that was one part and then when we played this av we have made uh, av videos uh, audio video uh, you know this communication uh, in eight different languages um putting up focus on cervical cancer prevention and its treatment detection with colposcopy treatment of cins uh, and how uh, cervical cancer can be prevented um many ladies uh, have now enrolled and also have taken uh, part in this you know program coming to healthcare providers um as a survey what we understood was most of the doctors are aware of the fact that cervical cancer is the only cancer which can be prevented and also they knew about it the only thing differences comes is are you truly adopting it in your day to day practice or are you taking so the challenge goes is counseling Uh, if a lady comes with no symptoms and she's just accompanying the other lady um to you know counsel this part of the lady to take you know further enroll for the screening program now that becomes a little challenge for the doctors because of the uh, hard press of time and another thing is uh, yes we do have to have a uh, uh, enhancement skill enhancement programs a uh, skill development programs for the doctors so that their confidence really increases for this we have come up with swasthya sundar nari prevent the preventable program now which has already covered around 788 societies so far so foxy as such is the largest professional organization for the gynecologists of uh, india 
and it comprises of 38,000 strong doctors, uh, all the gynecologists of the country. And it has been playing a major role in skill enhancements and confidence buildings in the doctor. In the, in the gynecologist uh, per se. So this SSNPP programs is well taken and we have almost covered about 16,000 uh, gynecologists so far from when we started in the month of August until date. Um, so this is what we are doing from Foxy and Foxy is also doing all sorts of good programs in association with WHO, with FIGO to get this on the platform. And uh, yes, Foxy is playing its major role in it. So can you tell us what made you get into creating the first preventive oncology center across the country? Um, yes, yeah, so this is a very passionate question and a passionate uh, area of interest for me. Um, as a teacher or a course convener for colposcopy and preventive oncology in Foxy, and um, we've been doing uh, from Sainiva's healthcare also, we have been doing this fellowship courses uh, since now a decade and a half. And um, almost 15, 000, 1,500 gynecologists have taken hands-on training uh, program from me. Last year, we started this online courses as well. Uh, also now, through as a WHO course convener for the country, one of the course conveners for the country, um, many doctors have also taken WHO courses. Now, all this said and done, so skill enhancement, training sessions, everything is done so well, but then, when I saw that um, uh, actually when people take uh, trainings and they go back, they are um, highly empowered. And when they start actually doing it, there are so many questions which then it's like an opening up of a Pandora box. And you do want to have some mentor to fall back on. I mean, whom do you fall back on and whom will you ask uh, these questions and how do you establish yourself as a ambassador sort of a thing? in your respective area where people look to your towards you and people start referring cases to you because not everyone are doing a colposcopy or not everyone are adept in doing this you know uh, 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 what you can call is um, comprehensive like even the treatment for cins so when i saw that and uh, so many of the doctors came forward and said madam we do want a um, mentoring programs as well so that we can come in touch with you. And that's how we then started. So in the year of 2016, uh, we rolled in this uh, program where we had this, um, because till then we had understood, basically we did have, I did understand what are the, um, we have already gone through that phase of establishing ourselves as, uh, you know, um, an ambassador in this field, or you can say, and we had, uh, we were the first people to start the preventive oncology comprehensive centers in Thane district. So knowing the fact that we have crossed this phase in a long, hard way, we wanted to cut it short for the people who are truly interested in taking up this field, taking up this sector, and uh, in especially in the tier two, tier three cities, you know, uh, uh, where, uh, where there is definitely a need of a well-established center to you know for the betterment of the community and also for the doctors who can refer the cases there and that's how then our uh, uh franchisee st centers started doctors came started coming forward they wanted to get attached with us and so far we now have 30 uh, franchise centers pan india it is working on the principle of um you know a standardized uh, program a standardized reporting system Utilizing the all the WHO advanced techniques for screening, say HPV, which is in a validated way, and uh, also then you know giving the right uh, type of treatment to the patients, and then we also have a uh, uh, you know call recall system, surveillance system, and uh, through this uh, franchise model, which is I probably think is the first of its kind in the country. Um, we have uh, been able to uh, cater to around, um, you know, 1.5 million uh, population and uh, ladies in our country. And that's how we have gone into the depth, uh, in the heart of villages and Adivasi villages and really been able to work for the community. And we have been also screened um, so far. We have been able to save, um, you know, uh, around uh, 4,000 to 4,500 ladies to develop into 
uh, cervical cancer by treating them at the earliest stage, at the CIN stage itself, in the precancerous stage. And our motto always remains of save uterus, do not do unnecessary hysterectomies. And I have seen over these years, the doctors who have taken our uh, franchise and are now are established uh, colposcopist and preventive oncologist in their respective areas. And uh, they have been uh, also working with the PPP model with the government also. So the government also is now recognizing these centers and are able to refer the cases which government isn't able to do to these centers as well. And even the uh, Navratna companies also are uh, highly interested and they are also tying up with these centers. And that's how we are being building chains, um, you know, throughout. The 2030 mission is of eradication of cervical cancer. How are you working towards that mission? Yeah, so 90, um, so this is a, this has become a very famous mission and I think it's, a, it is possible only when we do go into the heart of the community and um, we are, have a three-pronged approach. Now, the three-pronged approach would be, uh, first of all, first of all is public awareness. That's the public arm. The second arm would be for enhancement, skill enhancement of the doctors who can take it. And the third arm is a political awakening. So all these three arms put together, we would be in a position to have this goal, uh, uh, you know, at least 75% of the goal can be taken um, uh, will be uh, completed successfully by 2030. We do have this fantastic mission of 2030 cervical cancer eradication. So what we thought about it is most of 60% of our doctors are uh, private healthcare providers. And, and uh, most of them are also practicing two tier three cities. If we definitely want cervical cancer eradication um, in the country by 2030, it's not only the doctors, but also the it has to go to masses. Now we have to work towards masses. Now for this, we are coming up, most probably this also would be the first innovations uh, in the healthcare system, in preventive oncology, which our Sainiva's healthcare is uh, looking forward. We are working um, on, onto it. And most probably by this month end, we would be able to uh, roll it up and also inaugurate this uh, hub spoke model. So hub is uh, Sainiva's healthcare and the spokes are different area so we are looking out for and this is of course as with a technological technology partner with genworks they are giving the technology to us and they also have uh, ai augmented uh, screening devices because i believe we truly believe that it's not uh, you know uh, healthcare promoting or coaxing the ladies to go into this center it has to be the ladies themselves should take initiative the masses should be able to walk into the centers and get themselves screened. So that's where exactly we are putting our focus into. And these centers would be catering to all the masses exclusively in the tier, three, tier two, tier three cities where you might not find a, you know, a professional consultant sitting over there. Um, and uh, then, uh, uh, and then if you do not get that professional advice or the consultant, I mean, you do not expect this also in a very small town or a small three city, but then the ladies out there they should not be suffering, you know, because the, because of the lack of technology. So we are actually taking the technology along with the gen works. We are taking it to the heart of the country. You can say real villages and rural areas, putting up to the masses, opening up uh, centers where there would be um, fantastic screening uh, coming up. It's a whole gamut, like complete solution for a women's preventive health depending upon uh you know uh the breast health as well and also for the cervical health so we are not putting up as cancers or anything we are talking about uh generalized good health or pink health for the women dealing with breast as well as cervical because we all know the cervical cancer is the only cancer which can be preventable and if we are able to successfully launch this program and take it forward i think that would be the way forward for uh, you know, getting this mission of 2030 of WHO for cervical cancer eradication. That was truly really amazing. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, my next question is towards uh, Ms. Katanjali. What are the limitations for cervical screening that we face today? Now, when it comes to us as a technology partner at GenWorks, customer uh, customer needs are integral to us. 
So whenever we look at a solution or we look at uh, getting products, it is it is uh, the key thing for us is it has to be integral to what our customers are looking for. Now coming back to that's how we choose products in Genbox. Now coming out uh, coming up to what are the biggest challenges that we as a technology partner see in uh, terms of screening space is the biggest challenge in cervical assessment is the availability of device that are at point of care and which can deliver high quality diagnostic images and moreover it should be and it can be used by any any trained paramedics now moving to so what is currently available what is being used are huge our colposcopy that are huge and bulky which makes it easier, difficult to be deployed at point of care and moreover it needs experts to be there and we know that experts are not available everywhere as you move more from the city to a tier two tier three and beyond the experts uh, and specialist availability becomes a challenge so this limits our capability or our capability of doing mass screening early detection and ensuring that we intervene early to have uh, to ensure we give better lives to our patients and this uh, and this uh, what happens as a result is patients come at later stage advanced stages of cancer also tell us how genworks along with mobile odt is using the eva device to solve for these limitations and how is it fitting in perfectly with these so um, eva is a smart handled uh, digital colposcope it can be easily deployed at point of care and can be used by any uh, any trained paramedic and the, uh, one more thing uh, which is very interesting with eva is that it is built on it has an it is powered by ai it is powered by an hybrid ai which involves both biopsies and human annotation which makes its uh, uh, which makes it much much more accurate and this and to uh, top it to uh, top it to it is it's cloud connected which allows the experts to use the device anywhere uh, from anywhere access the images on their laptop on their mobile and even it offers a teleconsultation platform uh, for the clinicians to connect with uh, with an expert or uh, each other and take opinions what it even delivers and it is even it deliver it is based on a mobile platform and it is enabled to deliver colposcopy grade imaging this leads to and this it actually it helps us to overcome the challenges that we face to do mass screening and early intervention and early detection this is what eva has to offer